Hi, this is Nathan from Teach the Table. Today I'm teaching you how to play Eclipse, New Dawn for the Galaxy. This is a game taking place in a sci-fi future where humans and various alien races are all competing for control of different regions of the galaxy. Each player will represent a different group of Terrans, which are the humans, which are all the same, or in more advanced games, different races of aliens. Now keep in mind the aliens might have special abilities here or slightly different actions they can take on their board. So just keep track of the icons here to tell you what you can do. The game takes place over nine rounds. Whoever has the most points at the end of the nine rounds is the winner. Points are gonna be gained by controlling different regions of space represented by these hexes. If the hex has a monolith that's built on there, it's gonna be additional points. You may find various discovery tokens on the board, which will give you points. You get points by researching special technologies and filling up your tracks here. You can get points by having diplomatic relations with other people, represented by your ambassador tokens. And potentially, if there is any combat in the game, you get points by resolving that combat. On the bottom of your player board here, it shows you the actions you can take. And you have a card here that, that goes into detail of what those do. And on your board, pay attention to the symbols here because that represents how many of those you can do for each action. For instance, if I chose the build action, I could build two things because of the two wrenches there. You're gonna do actions by moving your influence disc up to whatever action you wanna do, and it's gonna go around the board. Everyone can do one action at a time. These discs are also gonna be used to show that you have control of certain regions of space. So eventually you're gonna be running kinda of low on these discs and you wanna pay attention to the cost underneath here because you're gonna to have to pay that amount of money at the end of the round to basically keep your civilization alive. So you don't wanna overexert yourself by having too much control over space or taking too many actions. You wanna stop at an appropriate time. If you don't wanna take any more actions, when it comes to your turn, you can pass by just flipping over this card like so. People continue doing actions until everyone has passed. Now when it comes back to you, even if you've passed, you still have an option to do what are called reactions which are kind of weaker versions of either upgrading, building, or moving, which just means you get to do one of those things instead of building two, you just get to build one thing. This section of your cubes here represents your population and you can eventually take them and place them down on planets to basically get you resources. There's three rows here, orange, pink, and brown, and those represent money, science, and materials. So you could take a money population, send it down to this little planet here that's orange too, and they can get you money. So your income at the end of the round is gonna show right here we would get four money. On the edge of the board here, we have a track which shows our supply of those various resources. So again, money, science, and materials. And as you gain resources or spend resources, that'll go up or down. The middle of your board is your technologies. There's three different types of technologies, military, grid, and nanotechnologies. And there's gonna be on the main game board various technologies that are available to you that you can eventually buy and you place them in whatever row they go in so the symbols match and they're also color coded. You're going to spend science to build these technologies and as you go along each row you're going to get a discount as you go. So I have a discount of one. This neutron bombs costs two. However there is a slash and a number on the right hand side here and that indicates the minimum amount that you're going to have to pay. So even with discounts I'm still going to have to pay two in this case. However, if I wanted to build something else like this phase shield that normally costs eight, I would have my discount, which makes it seven for me. On the top of your board, there's basically four ships that you can build and move around the board. And these are the various sections of them, which I'll go over when we talk about upgrading our ship parts. But for the most part, these are things that help with combat or ship movement around the board. The last area of the board is on the left hand side here, where you can either have your ambassador tiles from other races that you have diplomatic relations with, or any of these shield shaped regions are gonna have your reputation tokens that you get from combat, which will be victory points at the end of the game. Now that you understand what your player board represents, let's look at space. This is what it starts out at, at the beginning of a three player game. In the middle here, you have the galactic center. There's a pretty heavy combat if you're trying to take that over, but there's basically three regions where tiles are gonna get placed out as the game progresses. The first is right around the galactic center. The second, is basically in a circle where our starting tiles are. And then there's a third one that's right outside that. Now that does not have to go in a circle. That can go in basically any direction outwards as long as you still have tiles to do so. Like I mentioned, the game's played in nine rounds and those rounds consist of the action phase like we described earlier. And I'll go over all the actions here next. 
Then we have the combat, if there's any potential combat where two ships are in the same region as each other. Then you have the upkeep phase where we have to pay that cost in money like we talked about earlier to keep our civilizations existing. And you'll get your resources, whatever your income is based on your population cubes you have out on the areas. And lastly is the cleanup where we basically refresh everything and then we're gonna start again. First action you can do is explore and that's where you're gonna explore new regions that are next to where you either have an influence disc or a ship. On the hexes, there's these little half bullseye symbols and those represent wormholes. So you're gonna choose a region that's next to one of those wormholes that's connected to it and you're gonna pull a tile from the stack depending on what number of region that is. So if I wanted to go up here, that would be from the stack of ones. So you're gonna just choose the top one, flip it over, and you do have to connect it to one of your wormholes. If you don't like the tile you chose, you don't have to place it, you can just discard it and that would end your action. And depending on what's on there, sometimes there's gonna be icons that represent other things that go on there. So the first thing is this little symbol that's gonna indicate that there is a discovery token that's gonna go there. The last thing is because there's that little skull icon, that means that there's an ancient ship, sort of a mysterious alien race that's there. So if you wanted to go there with one of your ships, you're gonna have a combat before you can place your influence in that area. If you had drawn a different tile like this one, for instance, there's nothing there, so you can just place your influence directly on it. Each player has a number of these colony ship tokens next to their game board, and you can expend those at any point during any action to place a cube from your board onto a world in an area that you control. So if you wanted to spend two of these now, you could do that by taking a cube from your pink and from your brown track on your board and basically placing them like so. Some regions or some worlds are gonna have advanced areas and you're gonna to need to research special technologies to place your cubes there, but you can go in the regular ones automatically. If a region only has one discovery token like this, then when you place your influence there, you get to take that discovery token. Discovery tokens are all double-sided, so you can either decide to keep it for the two victory points at the end of the game, or whatever's on the other side. In this case, you would get six supply of materials. So you get to decide if you want to use it for the materials right now, or if you want to keep it at the end of the game, just put it next to your game board and total up these extra points at the end. The next action is the influence action. You can move up to two influence discs, uh, onto the board or off of the board. So you, those can either come from your influence track on your player board or you can move them off of the board out here. However, if you have cubes on these worlds, those are gonna go back to your track on their various colors as well. And then you can place them either to regions that are connected by a wormhole to one of your regions, or you can place them on a region where you have a ship even if it's not connected by wormhole to one of your influence regions. Since you have a ship there, you could exert your influence there. And those are as long as there's no other enemy ships. So if there was an enemy ship here or an enemy ship over here, you wouldn't be able to do that. There would be combat that gets resolved first before you can have influence. The other thing you can do on the influence action is you can restore two of your used colony ships. Again, remember that you can use your colony ships at any point to place cubes onto these worlds. If it's a gray or a white world like this one, you can take a cube from any of the areas on your board. So it could be money, science, or materials, and that gets to go there. It's kind of like a wild. If you ever decide that you wanna leave this area, take your influence away, that cube's gonna to have to leave as well, and that can go back on your board in any of those three spots. You don't have to remember which spot it came from. This is a good spot to explain diplomatic relations. If you ever have influence in a hex and you're connected through a wormhole to another hex where an, another player has influence, you can decide together if you wanna have diplomatic relations. If they agree to have diplomatic relations, you're gonna give your ambassador token with one of your cubes on it, and they're gonna give you the same from their supply. So the advantage is, this is gonna go on your board if you have spot for it, and it's gonna give you victory points at the end of the game, as well as it helps give you a little more production because you're getting cubes off of your board. The agreement to exchange ambassadors like this is also an agreement that you're not gonna have combat with each other. So in our instance, if the yellow player came and decided to attack us later, we're gonna break up our diplomatic relations. These, these tiles will go back to their respective players and the cubes will go back to where they came from. And the player who did the attacking is gonna take this traitor card, which is negative two victory points at the end of the game. 
However, there's only one trader card in the game, so it's sort of like a hot potato. It gets passed around the game, and whoever becomes the new trader is gonna get this card. So if someone else breaks the diplomatic relations between another player, they're gonna get this, and then these people will be off the hook. So explain the explore and the influence actions. The third one is the research action. That's where you get to basically spend science to buy one of these technologies and place it on your board. Uh, you can never have the same technology twice and you always have to pay the cost, keeping in mind your discounts like I talked to you earlier. So you're always gonna at least pay that minimum cost on there. Some of these technologies have immediate benefits like giving you an extra influence disc right away. Some of them allow you to build things in the future like orbitals or monoliths and many of them allow you to build various ship parts in the future, which brings us to the next action. The upgrade action lets you grab a number of these various ship parts to place onto your board to upgrade your ships. These two columns here of ship parts are available at any time. However, all of this box here requires you to have a technology in order to build them. For instance, having the plasma missile technology allows you to buy the plasma missiles. At the top of your player board are the blueprints for the various ships that you can build. You have your interceptors, your cruisers, your dreadnoughts, and your star bases. You can place an upgrade inside any of these squares like so. If you ever decide to place an upgrade where one already exists, you would just discard that one back to the game board and replace it. Some of the ships will have these icons outside of the squares, so those are permanent abilities of those ships. And there are a couple things to keep in mind when it comes to building ships. The first is that each ship will have a power source. In this case, it has three power, and you can never exceed that with the various pieces. So this one uses one, that one uses one. I would not be able to build this because that would exceed the power. Also, each of these ships that move around the board have to have a drive to give them movement. The star base does not move around the board, so that cannot have a drive. Upgrading your ships does not cost any money. You can just take a number of tiles that it says on your action on your game board. Lastly, once you upgrade a ship, all of that type of ship is considered to be instantly upgraded. So all of your cruisers are gonna be all the same at any point in time. I'll go over the rest of these icons as they come up during movement or combat. The fifth action you can do is building, which lets you build any of these ships, or if you have the technologies, you can build a star base, an orbital, or a monolith and they would just go out on a hex where you have an influence disc. You simply need to pay the number of materials as shown on the board here in order to build them. Each hex can only have one orbital and one monolith on them at any point in time. The monoliths just give extra victory points to the person who has an influence disc in that region at the end of the game. And the orbital is basically like a ring world or a halo which goes around a planet in that area. So you can put an additional population cube there either from your science or your money track. So it's just an extra way for you to get income. The last action is movement where you can make a number of movements using your ships going through the wormholes around space. You're gonna look at each type of ship and see how far they can go based on the number of hexes that are in there. So for instance, this one allows three movement and he's already got a drive of one. So the combined would be that your dreadnought can move four hexes in one movement. You can move the number of ships that it says on your player board for the move action. And the amount of space you can move is based on the drives like we talked about earlier. So the dreadnought had four movement. He can move one and two, and he would have to end his movement there because there's another ship. He would be what's called pinned. Getting pinned is anytime you move into a hex that has an enemy player's ships, you always have to leave a one-to-one -one ratio of your ships to their ships, regardless of what type of ship there is. So if this interceptor was able to move over to here as well, now I have two of my ships to one of their ships. So one of my ships could leave this space if I wanted to. The only caveat to that rule is if you move into the space here where the galactic defense is, that's going to pin every enemy that comes into there. So you, if you go in there, you won't ever be able to leave until you destroy this or if you get destroyed in the process. Those are all the actions you can do until you pass. Once you pass, this gets flipped over and you can do reactions doing just weaker versions of upgrading, building, or moving. Once everyone has passed and done all the actions they wanna do, we move into the combat phase. Combat in this game can seem kind of confusing. It's actually pretty simple once you understand all the icons in here. It's just pretty repetitive. It involves rolling a number of dice and you're gonna see if you make any hits or not. One hit will kill one ship, unless they have any modifiers like a hull, which will take an additional damage, or a shield, which will reduce the number on your dice by two. Rolling a six is an automatic hit. Rolling a one is an automatic miss. Anything in between is gonna require modifiers from your ship's blueprints in order to get up to a six in order to inflict damage. 
The first thing to look for on the ship blueprints here is the little arrow up icon that indicates the initiative that the ship has. So the higher the initiative, the first they get to act in the battle. The next thing to look for is any of these colored icons which will indicate the guns that are on that ship and that indicates one of each die that they'll get to roll to try to make hits. For instance, with the antimatter cannon, they get to roll one red die, and if they're able to get a successful hit, that's gonna count as four hits. Versus the plasma cannon with an orange die, if they're able to get a successful hit, that's gonna count as two hits. Combat never happens between three players at once, so it's always gonna be the two last players to enter the hex are gonna have to fight, and then the remaining players will fight. If there's a player that already has an influence disc, they're automatically gonna be the last player who has to fight because they're the defender of this tile. So in this example, we'll say that the yellow ship was here, these red ships came in, and the dreadnought, and then this little green ship came in at the very end. That means that first we have to battle between the red player and the green player, and then yellow is gonna battle the winner of that conflict. In this example, we'll pretend that all the ships in battle have not had any upgrades, so they all just have blueprints that look like this. This dreadnought has an initiative of one, from the drive there. And the interceptors have an initiative of two plus the one for their drive. So they have an initiative of three. However, we have a tie here and ties are always gonna be broken in the defender's favor. So in this case, red got to the tile first and green came on the scene last. So these red interceptors get to go first, then the green interceptor, then the red dreadnought. First thing that happens in combat is the missiles get to get fired. If anyone has missiles, those will get fired in initiative order. In this case, no one has missiles, so we'll skip to the next part, which is just using regular cannons. Each group of ships gets to fight simultaneously in initiative order. So starting with these two interceptors, each interceptor has one yellow dice. So we're gonna roll those two yellow dice now. So a one is an automatic miss. A three, we could try to get it up to a six if possible, but we don't have anything that's gonna increase it. So a three will be a miss. Next, it's the green interceptor's turn. He's gonna roll one yellow die and he gets a six. That's an automatic hit. So he's gonna choose one of these enemy combatants to apply that to. This dreadnought has two holes which are gonna deflect damage for it. So it's gonna actually take three hits before you're able to kill it. So I think that this interceptor would just apply this hit to one of these interceptors and he's gonna be dead. All the ships that you kill during battle are gonna go next to your player board. So in this case, the green player will put this red ship next to its player board to get some extra reputation at the end of this battle. Next would be the Dreadnought's turn. He's got two cannons, so that's gonna be two yellow dice that are gonna get rolled. He got two fives, which are not automatic hits. However, he does have an electron computer, which will increase his die roll up by one. So that turns both of those into sixes, and those are both hits. So he's gonna obviously just apply it to that interceptor and kill that interceptor. Since green is out of this combat, now it's between the red and the yellow. In this case, the yellow would again have three initiative, and since they're the defender, they get to be the first person. If there was a hit that was assigned to the dreadnought because of the hull, it would take a purple cube to indicate that it's taken a damage. So once it has two purple cubes and then it gets another hit, it would be dead. If yellow decided they were outmatched in this situation, they can decide to retreat as long as they choose an area where there's a wormhole connection going to another hex where they have influence and there's no enemy ships there. So in this case, he can move right to the edge right here to indicate that he wants to retreat instead of rolling for combat. You still have a chance for these other ships to roll their combat and potentially destroy him while he's trying to flee. But if both of these ships roll and they can't kill him, then he's actually gonna successfully flee and that will end the combat. Once the combat between all the ships is resolved, the player who is the victor can do one more roll of combat for each ship to try to destroy the population cubes. So we would start with this interceptor, he'd roll, got a six, so he can destroy one of these cubes of his choice. And that's gonna go back to the yellow player's board on the pink track in this case. Then the Dreadnought gets to roll two yellow dice, and he got two hits, destroys both of those cubes. Once all the cubes are removed, the influence disc is gonna go back to the yellow player's board, and the red player can place their influence there if they like. If you can't get rid of the last population cube, then the influence disc is still gonna stay there and you can't place your influence here. If there are multiple battles to be had on the board during the same combat phase, 
you're always gonna do them in descending order by looking at the number on the hex here. So this is 221, this one's 225. So this one would have happened first, and then we would resolve the combat from this one. At the end of combat, you're gonna get a number of reputation tiles drawn from your little black baggie here. You get to draw one for taking part in the battle. You don't get to do that if you're retreated. And then you get a number of tiles depending on the number of enemies that you defeated and what type they were. It's a maximum of five tiles. So then what you're gonna to get to do is draw up those tiles. For instance, in this example, the red player had killed one of the green ships. So he's gonna to get to do one tile for taking place in the combat and one for the green ship. So you draw two tiles and he's going to look at those for a number of victory points and he gets to keep one. So he's gonna keep the best one, the three in this case, that's gonna go face down onto his player board. If all the spots for the reputation tiles are already used up, he's gonna to have to discard one of these spots for reputation tiles or discard the one that he just drew. So depending on what the values of those were, he might just get rid of the one he just drew. This one's just for ambassadors as you can see by the shape. So we had the action phase, then the combat phase. Next is the upkeep phase. So the first thing you can do is if you have any of these colony ships, you can use as many of those as you like to get some more cubes, population cubes back down on the board following the normal rules. Next is your civilization upkeep. So what that means is you're gonna look at your income, in this case, for money, and you're gonna look at the cost that it costs you, so negative five. So you'd actually have to spend one money in this case to keep your civilization afloat. If you ever use up all your money and you need more to pay your civilization upkeep, you can do one of two things. The first is you always have this trading value. You can always exchange two of any resource for one of another. So you could use two materials to gain one more money. The next option to you though is you could go into bankruptcy where you use up all the money you have and then you can remove influence from the board in order to get some of your cubes back. So for instance, I could pull one of my influence discs back and these cubes would come back. There was one from each color. But you have to be careful because that reduces your income. So your income would only be three, but in this case you only need to spend three. So that would net you zero. So you wouldn't have to spend any money in this case. Once you've done the civilization upkeep, then you're gonna get an income of your science and materials. In this case, you get three of each. Lastly, we have the cleanup phase. So we're gonna draw some new technology tiles depending on the number of players. So we're pretending we're doing a three player game. Six new technologies will come out and go out on the board for the next round. Then we're gonna move all of our influence cubes from our actions back down to our influence track there to start the new round. And all of our used colony ships are gonna get refreshed to be brand new. After the cleanup phase, you're gonna move the round marker one spot to indicate you're on to round two, and you're gonna do it just like we did the first one. Game's gonna keep going until the end of the ninth round. Then the game, you're gonna total up all the points from the hexes that you have influence discs on. If there's any monoliths, those will be bonus points. Add up any discovery tokens that you have that you decided to keep the victory point value on. Add up any points that you get from the technology track. In this case, we just have two points there. And then if you're playing with ambassadors, which are not in a two or three player game, then you're gonna get points if you have any of another player's ambassadors still intact there. And again, if you're doing ambassadors, one person could potentially have the traitor. Then you would total up your reputation tiles if you have any here. And those are gonna be additional points at the end of the game as well. Player with the most points is the winner. If there is a tie, the player who has the most resources in their storage over here total is gonna to be the winner. That should be all you need to know in order to play Eclipse. On the back of the rule book is a good breakdown of the things I've already explained, sort of a summary of that, as well as a list of all the technologies giving you a good idea of what those do for you. So like I say always, don't forget to have fun and I'll see you next time.